You're listening to the Read Aloud Revival Podcast. This is the podcast that inspires you to build your family culture around books. Hey everyone, Sarah McKenzie here. This is episode three of the Read Aloud Revival Podcast. And first of all, thank you. All of your ratings and reviews in iTunes have made a huge difference. The Read Aloud Revival ranked number one in kids and family, which is just crazy awesome because the higher we rank, the more exposure iTunes gives us. And then we can reach more families with inspiration and encouragement to read aloud together. So thank you. If you haven't gotten a chance to leave a rating or review yet, I would really appreciate you taking a few minutes to do that. Today's show is going to be fantastic. I've got a conversation with Tish Oxenreiter from The Art of Simple, and also a few tips from my friend Pam about how to really leverage the library with your kids this summer. I'm also excited to share with you a new summer reading program that's worth your time. And at the very end, I'll tell you about how Sparkle Stories is offering one of my listeners a giveaway. So be sure to listen in so that you can get in on that. This episode is sponsored in part by Audible.com. Audible offers over 150,000 downloadable audiobooks for you and your kids. Everything from classics like Wind in the Willows and Huckleberry Finn to more modern popular fiction like the Magic Treehouse series and Ramona Quimby. You can try Audible for free by visiting readaloudrevival.com and following the links there. My family uses Audible to download a book every month, and I think it's definitely worth trying it out. When you click through the links at readaloudrevival.com, you support the podcast. So I really appreciate every time you do that. Today I'm chatting with Tish Oxenreiter, one of my favorite bloggers and very likely one of your favorites too. Tish, of course, is the inspiring voice behind theartofsimple.net, a very popular community blog that publishes stories and practical tips from a collective of writers, all dedicated to simple living. They talk about the art and science behind living a little simpler and a little unconventionally. She also hosts the Art of Simple podcast and recently published a book called Notes from a Blue Bike, The Art of Living Intentionally in a Chaotic World, published by Thomas Nelson. Tish and I are going to chat about what reading aloud looks like in her family, how the ebb and flow of her family life is impacted by books and reading, and how travel, something her family does a lot of, fits into the read aloud equation. Hey, Tish. Hi, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm great. Thank you. Well, I'm super excited to talk to you. I have wanted to sit and have a cup of, cup of coffee with you for like forever. So this is well, the next best thing. <laughs> I'm so glad I've got my coffee right next to me. So awesome. there you go. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Why don't you tell us a little more about your family? Sure. Well, I am married to a guy named Kyle. We've been married for 12 years, almost. And we have three kids, ages almost four, six and nine. And we have lived in a lot of places. So we've lived overseas. We've, I'm originally from Texas, so we've lived in Austin, and now we currently live in Bend, Oregon. So that's us. And you're getting ready to go on this huge, epic <laughs> adventure, right? Yes. In the fall, so September of 2014, my family and I are going to travel around the world going westbound. It's something we've been planning for about five years now. And because Kyle and I both work from home, and because we homeschool, we can pretty much pick up our lives and take them wherever we go. So that's what we're going to try for a year. That's awesome. And you're going all over the place, right? In that in that year, is that right? Yeah, that's the hope. You know, we're we've got a few pins in the map, is how we're calling it. You know, places we definitely want to hit up, and then we're just going to play it by ear and see what happens in between those places. So we we are doing that little ebb and flow between trying to have a plan, but also leave room for flexibility. Um, but we would like to hit as many continents as we can, if not all of them, and then um, be done by a year from now or so next summer. Very cool. Where are <laughs> a couple of places that you absolutely don't want to miss? No. Well, it's funny. We each have our, our list of places. So my daughter can't wait to go to China. Um, my son, he thinks 
Madagascar, although I've told him several times we're not going to Madagascar, my six year old. <laughs> I think he thinks he's going to meet a lion named Alex. Yes, and, I was going to say that. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the thing about certain places is that we want to make sure, well, not make sure, but, you know, we live frugally. So it's not like this trip is going to be some extravagant, you know, sort of thing. Sure. Most places we're going to visit are going to be on the way to other places, is kind of how we're thinking of it. So Madagascar really isn't on the way to anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think we're going to hit it unless we find some amazing flight. Um, I am excited about New Zealand. Never been there. Been to Australia and we're going to be there. But I'm super excited about New Zealand. And, um, you know, we'll go back to Turkey and spend some time there and just visit old friends and honestly cross off some things from when we lived there that we never got to do. Um, and my husband is excited about, you know, he's a mountain climber. He's from Oregon originally. Mm -hmm. And so he's excited about some of the more mountainy locations, like um, some places in South America, maybe seeing Kilimanjaro. Um, he has spent some time on the Alps, but even seeing more of that in Central Europe. So, yeah, lots of places we're going to see. Oh, that's awesome. I just yeah. think that's going to be <laughs> awesome for the rest of us to be able to watch uh, through the blog, you know? <laughs> yes, <laughs> it'll be too. fun. And we're in the middle of um, creating a travel site that'll go with it. It's going to be a channel on the blog just for the, oh, I for the trip. So, okay. Yes, that's how it's going to work. Cool. Very cool. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's talk about your family's read aloud habits. So sure. um, what does reading aloud look like in your family right now? Well, our absolute never miss read aloud time is at night before bed. And I'm sure that's the case with lots of parents, really. But um, the way that looks like for us right now is my husband and I take turns. So every other night, we, we go back and forth. And each kid gets to pick out a book. So we're talking three books. And they vary in length and style. You know, sometimes Calvin and Hobbes is picked. Sometimes yeah. it's a chapter book. But my, my thought is, yeah, there are some books that are a little more highbrow or a little, you know, not so much... Um, intellectually above my children, but richer in literature, you know, and I want them to dive into this, but I also want them to just truly enjoy the pastime of reading and being read aloud to. And so, you know, things like Calvin and Hobbes or just simpler books are just as fun and just as important, I think. Yeah, memory building kind of memory stuff. building. Yeah, absolutely. And just, you know, some of those characters that you read when you're younger with those, you know, sh shorter books, those become some of your favorite yeah, like what you said, memories and, and just such a introduction to art and good cadence of words and fun characters and humor, you know? Yeah. And so um, there's some great shorter books out there. And, and so we don't stress as much at night our, um, our choice in books. But um, we also read at other times of day. We have quiet times every afternoon, all ages. And um, so usually for my younger ones, I'll read a short book to them. My older one, I'll just go on our own and maybe read. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then at breakfast, we read aloud too. So oh, we do. read. That's awesome. We do. Um, is that school we, related or is that? Uh, you know, well, for us, the way we do homeschool, we don't really have a clear delineation between school and life, you yeah. know? Yeah. So like at breakfast, we'll read um, usually a chapter from the Child's Story Bible by Catherine Voss, and we'll talk about it some. And then we'll either just read a book that we're working on, like a chapter book, or um, we'll listen to an audio book like Story of the World or something like that. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah, Jim Weiss reads those, and he's going to be on the podcast in the next episode. So Yes, awesome. and he is amazing, and that's such a great audio book. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Reading aloud has sort of morphed for us, too. I mean, it, it kind of changes and with the way our family Mm -hmm. dynamic changes because you know the schedule always changes depending on whether it's summer and there's lots of neighbor kids around to play with or um uh -huh. or whether we're kind of thick in this school thing you know school year but one of the things I love about um not having a clear line between school and and life is that reading can just kind of overflow like like you were saying just sort of yeah. be like a family thing we do <laughs> exactly it's just a thing we do that's yeah. right yeah mm -hmm. so it doesn't really feel like school time it's just right. this is something we do yep cool us how does it look different than it used to for you? I mean, did it, obviously, as kids get older, we start reading chapter books and longer, you know, fiction and that kind of thing. But um, do, mm -hmm. do you find yourself reading aloud less as they get older or more? Or has it kind of stayed steady? Um, if anything, we've started reading aloud more and not less. And I think that has to do more with the kids' ages that I think as they get older, they can take in more information. You know, I, I look at my three-year-old who sits in on story time 
Um, but by the second book, he starts wandering, you know, like he's still in the room, but he's kind of either hanging upside down on the bed or just kind of walking around. I mean, he's listening, but he's also kind of not fully there. And I think that could be our kid's personality. You know, his, he's just a very curious, busy guy. Yeah. Um, but I, I also, I know not to worry about that, you know, with my yep. firstborn, I would think, oh my gosh, she's going to hate reading because she's not sitting still with the book <laughs> yeah. in her lap. And I know now, eh, that's very, you know, yeah. that just, that's just how they are. Yeah. And so now I feel like we read maybe longer because the older two who are six and nine can actually sit there and fully listen to a book. I mean, they still wiggle some, but, um, so yeah, I would say it, it's longer and, you know, more varied maybe. My yeah. my oldest when she was two, I remember just laughing. We went through this phase where it was, I want to say like six months. It, it seemed like six months where she picked the same book every <laughs> night. And it wasn't even a story. It was the Richard Scarry's. Um, oh gosh, where you're like that, pointing and. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it was this big book. And it was the book I had when I was a kid that someone else had when they were a kid. So this is the 1963 version. So it's been taped like 10 times. And so it's falling apart. And I'm sitting here trying to hold this big book you know, trying to keep my two year old still. And I just got so tired of that same book. But I, I even like looked up online, like, is there something wrong with my kid? This is the kind of parent I was when I was, when I just had one. And, you know, of course, everyone's saying, nope, that's just the way it is. And they'll grow out of it. And of course she did. And so, yeah, now I feel like there's a lot more variety. I truly look forward to story time. It's, it's not a chore for me. That's one of my favorite parts of the evening with my kids. Yeah, so. my, it's mine too. It's probably my favorite thing to do with my kids. That and playing board games. I really like playing board games. But mm -hmm. um, but I, I do enjoy reading aloud more now that they're older because I like novels and chapter stories better than picture books for the most part. So I yep. find myself getting excited about a new title or you know, something that I haven't read it since I was a kid or something I never got to. I mean, I never listened to Little House on the Prairie or any of the Little House series when I was a kid, which kind of floors me now because the audiobooks for Little House have become kind of a major part of our family life. So um, those are That's some cool. of the things that I think are really fun about reading aloud to our kids as we get to kind of Relive it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Relive it or live sure. it the first time. <laughs> for sure. Well, you know, I, I've never listened to the audiobooks of that, but um, we have read two of the books out loud. Um, Little House, we did the first two. So Little House in the Big Woods and then Little House on the Prairie. And um, I never read them either as a kid. And I felt, yeah, in some ways deprived because I feel like, isn't everybody supposed to have read those as a kid, at least if you're in the States? Yeah, um, yeah. But so Kyle and I, my husband, we were just like on our the edge of our seats reading them. Like, all, I just remember the first time, this is several years ago now when I first read Big Woods and um, our two younger kids, my, my third was a baby, but they were like enthralled and Kyle was like on the edge of his seat too. Yeah. And, um, and, you know, it'd be like, okay, and that's odd. He'd be like, one more. And he'd be like, yeah, keep going. Yeah. <laughs> so we were yeah. all into it. It was really fun. The audiobooks are awesome. Cherry Jones reads them. Oh. And um uh, I don't know if you're familiar with her. She's an actress. But yes. the funny yes. thing is I didn't even I wasn't familiar with her. And then we were watching some movie. I can't remember what we were watching or maybe a TV show. I can't remember now. <laughs> I sound completely like I don't know what I'm talking about. I don't. But um and we recognized her voice and my husband's like, Oh my gosh, that's Laura. Nice. I <laughs> but, love that. Yeah, the the whole series is really good. I think those ones might be especially good to listen to on audio because there's so much description. Sometimes yeah. I have a hard time reading books that have lots of description without lots. you know sounding yeah. like I'm, I don't know. <laughs> Reading a textbook or something? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. So is that, is Little House, did you find that like at the library or on Audible? Or? We listened to those at the library, but I should check and see if they have them on Audible. I bet they do. Um, mm -hmm. Well, you know, sometimes older books are even on LibriVox or something where yeah. it's completely royalty free. I didn't know if those would be, but that's cool. Yeah, yeah. I'll have cool. to, pay, I'll, I'll um, dink around online and see where I can find them and link them to in the show notes so people can sure. find them because those are awesome. awesome. Yeah, that's great. So your family has um, homeschooled some years and sent your kids to school some years and just kind of whatever works for your family at the time, right? So mm -hmm. how has reading aloud um, changed depending on where your kids are getting their the bulk <clears throat> of their schooling done? Sure. Well, you know, it's funny because we do go back and forth, but the older my kids get, the more I see the value behind homeschooling. Um, at least not not at all to say that there's no value in, in sending our kids to school, but in terms of our personality and our family culture, um, 
as far as reading goes, I feel like we get so much more out of it when we do homeschool. Um, and the reason is because we can make it a seamless part of our life. Like I said earlier, um, there's not this delineation between this book for school and then this book for fun. And, you know, I'm, I'm one of these parents. I'm not a control freak at all, but I just want to make the most of my kids' time. And I want them to read good stuff, you know. Yeah. And yeah. so, and so to me, it's like, if we're going to be reading this fantastic book, there's no reason to read, you know, quote, something else for school and then something for fun. We read the quality stuff just for school slash life slash whatever you want to call it, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, you know, it's not to say that you can't have amazing story times when you send your kids to school, because I know of some people who make that happen. It's just harder. You know, I, when our kids were in school, I didn't see them all day. And then when you pick them up, they're tired, you know, and so they need their downtime. They right. want to play. They need lots of play time. And then honestly, we didn't get much story time in until bedtime. So I've really, really missed that part of parenting, you know, and, and we could read over breakfast, but it was a lot more rushed because we had to be somewhere at a certain time. Whereas at home, we don't start school till 10 o'clock. And that's because my daughter, my oldest is a major sleeper in her. Huh, okay. and, and I just figured that's because she needs it. You yeah, know, yeah. I'm not going to fight it. So she wakes up about nine and ha just has some alone time. She's usually playing in a room by herself and comes downstairs. She knows she has to be down by 930, okay. which sounds so amazing. Um, and that's when we usually, I've already eaten breakfast. And so that's when we usually do a story time over breakfast. Awesome. Yeah. What are your favorite, what are your family favorites? For reading aloud? Mm -hmm. mm, gosh, there are, gosh. <laughs> That's a tough question because yeah, there's I know. so many good ones. Okay. <laughs> um, as far as some of our favorite picture books, I'll start with that. Um, some of my favorites are Frog and Toad. Oh, yeah. Because okay. there's such good dialogue and so many, so much of the plot and the things they say to each other so is just funny. But yeah. it's not ha-ha funny. It's witty funny, you know? Yep. And so it comes out better when you say it out loud versus just reading it, you know? Exactly. And it's one of those things you want to share. And because I find it funny sometimes when the kids don't even get it, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. It, it kind of has that bonding experience. Well, I'll explain why it's funny. The same goes for Winnie the Pooh. Um, we read the entire The Complete Tales of Winnie the Pooh. Um, and House at Pooh Corner this past year. And those are big books. And They are big. You know, I've never uh -huh. read those. Okay. Um, I keep yeah. seeing them recommended everywhere, um, but I've never, uh -huh. I've never done it. So you guys <laughs> love them, huh? Well, and I have to say they usually are recommended for kids far too young. Yeah. They are books, I would, I would say minimum of age eight. Eight to 12 is the best age for Winnie the Pooh, which sounds funny because we decorate our baby nurseries with Winnie the Pooh, you right. know? Yeah, um, right. But it is, they, the humor is completely missed, I think, too young. That's not to say you can't enjoy them. I mean, my kids were, my younger guys were six and three and they were fine, you know, and they laughed. But I don't think they understood it until I explained it or they heard their older sister laughing. Um, but there's just the verbiage that they use, the words, the voices, the, I mean, they are so well read out loud. I'm so glad we had that experience together. I teared up um, when we read the last chapter, like oh. when it was time to say goodbye, because it was so good. I was sad that we were done. Okay. I know we could do it again, but. That's awesome. My older yeah. kids, my oldest three are eight, 10, and 12. So we're going to do that then. Because, oh, yeah. They yeah. would like it. Okay. It's fun. They're so funny. Okay. Okay. Yep. Cool. And do you guys listen to audiobooks? We do, yeah. Um, we check out a lot in the uh, from the library, especially when we're about to go on a road trip. Um, we that's a great way to get audiobooks. And now, that's not to say our kids sit perfectly still and never talk, you know, during <laughs> audiobooks. Yeah. So um, I, I would say a lot of times in the car, short either sh a collection of short stories works well, or a book with short chapters. So like Paddington Bear, we really liked. Um, right now we're listening to Richard Kipling's Just So Stories. Okay. And those are read by Jim Weiss. I was just um, going to ask who you, who, which yeah. version you're, okay. Jim Weiss. And those are so good. And the kids laugh because of his voice, you know, the way he does the, the characters. Um, and those are good short stories. You know, you can listen to one between now and Costco kind of thing, yep. you know. <laughs> um, and so those are great. Audio, uh, for quiet times, my daughter sometimes will listen to audiobooks in her room, and that's a great way for her to um, tap into the classics, I feel like, a little more. 
um, while she's doing something else, you know, building something with Lego, yet being read out loud, some book that would seem maybe intimidating yeah, um, to tackle on her own, but um, is great for her. She's even, even the um, easier books she's listened to, like uh, Boxcar Children, she's checked all those out at the library, and those are great. Yeah, my kids really time. like those audio Boxcar uh-huh. Children. Mm-hmm. Right, right. And um, so I don't know. She's uh, That's a great time just to tap into some of those, you know, like Peter Pan or not not hard books, but books that are, just have slightly older language, I would say. Yeah. Um, my oldest daughter really loved listening to Little Women um, when mm. she was too – she was a little too young to read it herself. And now, now she still – I mean, I think she did read it after she listened to it, so – Maybe it just sort of like opened the door for her, you know? Sure. Yeah. Well, yeah, you know, it's funny. We kind of think of audiobooks as sort of the um, second best to reading them yourselves, you know? I mean, I think parents tend to think that way. Like, well, I would prefer her to read this on her own, but I guess the audiobook is the next best thing. And they're two different acts, of course, listening and reading. Yeah. But if you think about it as adults, we love being listened to or read to, oh, you yeah. know? Oh, we love yeah. talk radio. We love podcasts we love audiobooks so why shouldn't our kids you know we all love a good story being read to us so it's the same thing for them yeah absolutely and that's something that adam or not adam um andrew put talked about a little bit in the first podcast um mm. of, he talked about just what's happening in our brains really when we're listening to stories being read aloud and it's uh something totally worthwhile and not really subpar to reading yourself. You know, I, I know that that is the default I have to is to think that if they can read it to themselves, it would be better than if they listen to someone read it to him. And he sort of just blows that all out of the water. Like that is not true. And there it does something totally different for their vocabulary and their ability to string together really well-formed sentences. And mm-hmm. so it's cool. That's, That's cool. Yeah. I'm going to have to listen to that one. I'll listen yeah. to it when we're done recording. <laughs> yeah, It's episode one. <laughs> <Cool>. <laughs> Um, well, I did ask my, uh, Facebook friends, uh, mm-hmm. some, if they had any questions for you. And okay. one question I got from Jill was, um, what has influenced your read aloud choices other than your immediate family's preferences? Hmm. So I don't, del- I don't think of a difference between reading aloud and just what we have in our library. So, you know, silent reading or reading aloud. Um, a lot of my choices come from recommendations from people I trust. So um, I don't know if you've heard of the book, Honey for a Child's Heart. Yes, I love that book. Okay. I, I refer to that book quite a bit if I need a good idea or so. Um, one of my really good friends who's also a blogger named Heidi Scoville, she's got great taste in books. So sometimes I'll just go to her site and like, tell me what to read. You know, oh, that awesome. kind of thing. What is hers? Yeah. What is um, her, her site is Mount Hope Academy. I can oh, say yes. Like, okay, yes. I know. <laughs> <laughs> she's great. She's so good. Um, and I, I don't know. I guess I, I think I have a pretty good grasp of what's what might be twaddle and what might be quality. And so I try to steer my kids in that direction, at least in terms of what we buy. You know, I, I, I tend to find authors and then stick with the authors a lot, which can be good or bad. You know, I like building up a collection of like Robert McCloskey or Kevin Hinkies or, mm-hmm. or books like that. But I, I know there's probably tons of authors that I have yet to try that I need to. Um, and so I would say that, you know, just, just learning as I go and then picking up some of my favorites and sticking with them. Is that something you feel like you have learned along the way, how to pick good books? Or is that something you just kind of felt like you knew how to, you've always known how to do? No, it's, it's not something I've always known how to do, but you know, the idea with twaddle, you know, the Charlotte Mason phrase that, um, books that are just dumbed down literature, watered down absence of meaning, you kind of start, you get a sense of what they are. Um, you, it's kind of one of those, you know, it when you see it sort of things. Yeah. And so, um, I leave that kind of stuff. I'm not like a black and white. No, that shall not enter my house because we are highbrow in our home. Um, <laughs> but I stick to that more with the library, you know, letting my kids, okay, if you want another book on hamster care, sure. If you want another Garfield comic book, okay. You know, but yeah. we'll check those out at the library. Um, because I want them to just enjoy the process of reading. Yeah. Um, but as far as buying books, I do stick to just, you know, I want everything on my shelf to be really quality. And um, a lot of that just comes from word of mouth, hearing what other people recommend and trusting them and trying it out, you know. And sometimes if I'm not sure, I'll we'll check it out at the library first. So there's a book by Mo Willems that um, 
we checked out three times at the library and we finally decided, okay, we, we should just buy this one for our home. And so we did. It's Country Dog City Frog. No, City Dog Country Frog. City and, Dog Country Frog. I don't think it's right. that one. Okay. And, and my kids just loved it and I loved it too. And so um, we just waited. I saw it at Half Price Books and just snagged it up. So, you know, it's a lot of trial and error in some ways. Yeah. with When it comes to Twaddle, I know that I don't read twaddle aloud because that's like torture, you know, <laughs> to, try, <laughs> to try to read aloud something that's just, I don't know, mm -hmm. Junie Bean Jones or something. That's like oh, torture. Oh. But when my kids are going, when they're, you know, they've learned how to read and they're kind of going through that fluency stage where they need to read a lot and a little bit underneath their reading level so they get faster at it, they do read like stacks. Of, I mean, I know my second daughter went through this phase where she loved the Disney fairy series, uh -huh. which I thought was just like a horrid. <laughs> and I would never read those out loud. But I I also didn't, you know, stop her from checking out a stack of them at the library and it made her, you know, helped her. I know Susan Wise Bauer says to do that too. She yep. says to let them just read lots and lots and lots of things that are a little below their level and it makes their fluency speed up. And then that's can, right. Yeah, that's right. I actually asked Susan at her house one time because I was, my daughter was seven at the time. And, you know, I said the hamster care thing. I wasn't joking at all. Um, there was a phase when she went through, like, we didn't even have a hamster. Oh. <laughs> and she was so fascinated in these, like, small rodent care section of the library. Oh, that's really and funny. And check okay. out all these books. And I'm just thinking, why? You know, but, um, and so I asked Susan that. And she was like, ah, just let her. Um, it's no big deal, really. You know, she's just wanting to read something that interests her. You know, yeah. it's just an interest. It'll pass, maybe, right. and if not, you know, that'll she'll pursue that. But it's like, yeah, you're right. I'm I'm way overthinking this. I'm making it's you know, book reading should be fun at its core. Right. So you know, I don't know. So so that makes me wonder: Do you pick out your read alouds? Like when it's time for y'all to have read aloud time, do you pick them out or do you let your kids? I usually pick them. Nowadays, I usually pick them. Um, although if my kids, um, if there's like a book that they've been eyeing or that they've been wanting me to read aloud and they ask, then I'll kind of put it in the queue, you know, and we'll get to it. But um, we don't read a ton of picture books. We're, we're going to get back into that um, phase here because my kids are 12, 10, 8. And then I have yeah. a two-year-old and twin Ah, 10 month olds. <laughs> got it. Okay. So you yeah. have that younger group coming in. Yeah. So okay. we're going to get back into, I mean, we, of course I read picture books to them and, and they'll play a bigger part in our normal day to day mm -hmm. kind of reading aloud again. But for chapter books, generally I, I choose them. Um, and then the kids just choose their own reading. Um, although listening to you say that your kids pick the, the stories before bed, I bet my kids would probably totally dig that. <laughs> uh, so if you're reading a chapter book then at night, do you just do a chapter from it and then move on to something else? That could take a while, I guess. It does. Um, yeah, we do one chapter. So like right now, for example, um, we tend to, this has been a new thing for us. We're trying it out. We tend to read two books together. So the three of us or the three kids and the parent will read two picture books together and then do the good night thing. And then the, our oldest daughter will get a chapter read to her in her bed. Oh, nice. Um, so that's, that's what's working. I I'm hesitant to say that's what we do because we've been doing this about a week now, Yeah, <laughs> um, but it seems to be working. Um, so we're like right now, for example, we'll just let the boys pick something out. Um, and there are times I veto something where it's like, no, 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 we're not going to do that. But uh, a lot of times, you know, I'm pretty okay with something from our shelves because I like everything we own. Um, and then whenever we uh, do my older daughter, it's whatever book we happen to be reading. Like right now we're doing the Wing Feather Saga by Andrew Peterson. I don't think and, I know that one. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's really good. Um, we're only in book one so far, but I really like it. And um, so we'll just read a chapter. If the chapter's short and she's like, more, more, I might read too, just because I want to know what's going to happen next. You yeah. know, I like it just as much as she does. I love that. I love it when there's, you know, <laughs> that's usually how it is, I think, with the <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so I um, consult that honey for a child's heart. And then just various book lists that I found online um, or mm -hmm. in Susan Wise Bauer's books. Or, yes, um, yes. And so I feel like the, by the time we actually choose, you know, when I choose my books and we read them, they're almost always just fantastic. And I can't believe I got to be the age I am without ever having read it before. Oh, <laughs> I know. Kind of I know. It's amazing. Yep. Yeah. And um, we just moved a couple of weeks ago. And oh. as I've been setting up bookshelves, you know, and unpacking boxes, I've been floored at how much twaddly junk has gotten onto our shelves. I didn't even realize. I mean, like, like, 
tons of Disney books and mm-hmm. um, I don't know. I'm trying to think like TV character kind of yep. cartoony. So I've been weeding through those ruthlessly and realizing <laughs> that um, especially as my toddler, you know, getting to that age where she, of course, just brings us stacks upon stacks of books. I enjoy reading to her as long as she doesn't bring me Dora the Explorer. <laughs> I feel like right. I'm going to. Yeah. Yes. We, so. um, it's funny how that happens. You know, we're pretty ruthless yet. I, I just purged a bunch of books about a month ago as well. And, you know, we didn't have a ton, but there were just books that just felt like, you know, there, it, this isn't the worst ever, but we could just do so much better. And I definitely, I, I hold the same philosophy with books about I, the rest of the house where I want to look at everything on here and be happy with it. I want, I want to feel completely good about my kids pulling anything off the shelf and I know that they're reading something decent, you know, and that doesn't have to mean Canterbury Tales. It can be, you know, George and Martha or something, but it's quality. Yeah. Um, and, but the one way I differ from books versus the rest of the house is I am okay with collecting books as long as they're quality. My mom saved a lot of my books from when I was a kid. So I am now reading a lot of the books that I read when I was a kid, like the actual book, not just, you know, a copy of it. Very cool. And that is a very cool experience for me. So I love the idea of being able to pass that down to my kids. So I am okay with keeping books. Well, my uh, mother-in-law gave my oldest two daughters her entire collection of Trixie Belden. And they're from her childhood and they are really treasured and it's just so cool to see her, you know, her name is in her handwriting inscribed in the front cover. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. Yeah. There's something about that. Um, It is very cool. I've been trying to talk a little bit on the podcast about, you know, building a family culture and we've sort of talked about that with your, uh, not separating read aloud, and reading books in general from the rest of your family life. But is there anything else that you wanted to say about how books help form your family culture? Um, you know, we take books with us on the go because we travel a lot. And we, I don't know, they, they become sort of our connection to our home base. And now we don't think of our home base as wherever we're living because we move frequently. We think of our home base as the five of us together. Oh, and like so... That. Yeah. And so books, especially just treasured books that we've read again and again, become sort of our mainstay. You know, they're kind of like, it's kind of like um, Christmas ornaments. You know, you open them up, you're like, oh, this is from aunt so-and-so. And, you know, you have those memories and those things that just immediately anchor you to uh, your family of origin. Well, I think of books in that way when we travel. And so, you know, we're, we're selective because they need to be lightweight and thin and all those things. But they, they bring us back to who we are, especially after a day of um, something foreign. We're in a new city. We, we've done nothing but meet new people, eat different foods, do this kind of stuff. And yet at the end of the day, whether we're in a hotel room or in a tent or, you know, sometimes on the plane, we can open up you know, if you give a moose a muffin or, or blueberries for sal or some kind of book that we've read a hundred times mm-hmm. and it's, and it's like comfort food, you know, it's it like everybody. Yes. It's like suddenly like, this is who we are. Okay. This yeah. is something we value. This is a story that's almost part of our own family's tradition. You know, that's so cool. Yeah. You know, when you're reading, well, I mean, when you're traveling, you make reading aloud just part of your day, just like any other time. Yep. Oh yeah. We make it an important part of our day. You know, we do the audiobooks in the car. We'll do it in the, on a plane too. We'll, um, get the MP3s and put them on an iPhone or iPad or something. And we'll do that as well. Um, we'll still try and bring books as best we can, especially for our younger guys that are still in picture books. You know, I think it's important, the actual act of holding a physical book and turning mm-hmm. the pages and looking at the pictures. My daughter is now good with a Kindle. So I'm, I'm cool with that when we travel. Yeah. And, And we also have this like silly little history that or tradition our family has done where we um, tell what we we've called or what our kids have called magic golden train book uh, stories. Yeah, very silly. Um, We just every couple nights, my husband and I will take turns telling a magic golden train story. And it's just it started on a whim, I think, on one of our trips where a brother and a sister have a, a secret tunnel in their room that leads to a magic train that takes the kids places. Oh, cool. Yeah. And, and you just make, make it up as you go. <clears throat> yeah. Oh, you know, or awesome. they'll say like, let's go to India this time, or let's go to Antarctica. And we're like, okay. And you know, we'll <laughs> let them add to the story. And stuff. so it's not an, it's not a physical book or a real story. We mm-hmm. just kind of 
wing it. It's been fun. And I think they'll have good memories of that later. I bet they will. I bet it'll be one of those things where you're sitting around the table at Thanksgiving, you know, 20 years and they'll go, oh my gosh, that was my favorite one. Do you remember that? And they'll remember way more than you will. Oh, way more. (laughs) Way more. It's so funny how they do that. Yep. So now when you bring audiobooks on your in your travels, how do you do that? Do you use Audible? Do you go to, I mean, buy them? Do you, how do you? We do a mix. So, um, you know, on a plane, I mean, on in the car or if we're not going for very long, we'll check something out at the library okay. and just have CDs. Um, now, and then, you know, we'll use our computer to play them if we are in the car. But, I mean, not in the car. But if we are... Um, going somewhere longer or we just don't want to deal with it, I'll either do Audible or I'll do something like LibriVox or some kind of service where it's the royalty-free books, you know, the ones that are available to anyone. Yeah. And we'll play it through our uh, iPad or some form of that. Or I'll, I'll import them into iTunes or whatever form it is. So, yeah. Okay. Cool. <clears throat> yep. Yep. Well, this has been awesome. Thank you so much for talking to me. And that was really, really fun. I think yeah. our listeners are really going to enjoy that. So I like... I have enjoyed getting a peek into the way your family uses books. So, well, thank you. It's been really fun. I love talking books. Heading to the library can be a real challenge, but like Tish and I talked about in today's show, there are so many benefits to making it a part of our family life. My friend Pam from Everyday Snapshots, edsnapshots.com, has some great ideas for how we can leverage the library with our kids this summer. I invited her onto the show to share those, so I'm super happy that she's here. Hey, Pam. Hey, Sarah. How are you? I'm awesome. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks. Well, you have some great ideas for making better use of the library this summer, and I need all the help I can get because I have been somewhat unmotivated to take my whole crew in. (laughs) I wonder why. Right. (laughs) I don't know if all of our listeners know that I have six kids and three of them are two and under. So (laughs) heading to the library would be kind of like bringing the zoo with me. (laughs) But what can we do to make library visits more pleasant this summer? Well, you know, going to the library is such an important part of what we do to foster that culture of reading in our home and with our kids. And so I think the very first thing we need to do as moms is make the library a priority in our home. And we do that by having a set day and time that we go to the library. And so, for example, my kids know that we go to the library on Thursday afternoons after karate. And that's when we go. They have it in their head that we're going. And so if they have any expectations about what books they would like to get or some topic they would like to read about, they know that they're going to be able to to get to look into that at that time. And they probably already thought about it, you know, like looked forward to it and thought, oh, next time we go to the library, I want to look for the next book in this series or whatever. Exactly. Or they come up with a topic during the week that they're just, you know, gangbusters about researching, you know, ocean animals or something. And they're like, oh, yes, we can look when we go to the library. Yeah. So having that, it it fosters that expectation for them. They know that there's a chance coming up that they're going to get to go and look. And then we make it a priority. You know, I think it's so easy for library time to get pushed aside when life gets busy. And so if we... Um, have it be something that we prioritize within our life, you know, no matter what happens, we're really going to try to make an attempt to get to the library this week. This is something important that we do. Yeah, when it has a regular place on the schedule, it sends a message that we don't even have to say out loud. It just sends the message by being a part of your week, right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So that's the first thing we do. Okay. Make it a priority and make it regular. That's, That's right. Okay. The next thing that we've done that just made the biggest difference for my kids is we got everyone their own library card. Awesome. Yes. Even the four-year-old has his library card. And I have to tell you, I was really resistant towards this. Our library does um, prints out the little like cash register receipts for the books that you take out. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I used to bring home one long cash register receipt and um, put it up on the refrigerator and then check all the books off when we took them back. Now I have four smaller ones to keep track of. But the difference that it's made in the kids' excitement level and their attitude about going to the library 
um, it really makes it worth it. That's awesome. Well, the hardest part for me in thinking about that is just I have a tendency to run up some serious fines. <laughs> do you how do you have do you have a strategy for keeping you know those fines down with so many different library cards to keep track of? The set day and time to go. Okay, to the- yes, that's right. Of course, because if you're going every Tuesday, then you won't get out of you know things don't get out of control. <laughs> Very good idea. <laughs> help make it a priority is, you know, I don't know about your family. We know we have 40 books. We've got to get back to the library. So we'd better be going. Yeah, right. <laughs> is that, you know, 10 cents a pop. I don't even know what it is. It's, you know, five or 10 cents a pop. But um, when you have 40 books. Well, it adds know, up fast. Yeah. 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 So getting the library card, they were so excited. They were so excited to get the card. And now they're so excited to stand in line with their own little stack of books and give the lady their card and um, and do the checkout process. So it's just been something that's really made them take ownership in the library visits. Okay. What next? Um, library events. Mm. And hanging out at the library. Now, I have to say, I was kind of a, a old curmudgeon about the idea of this because you know, libraries, that's where you go to get books to read. <laughs> and there should be all this other stuff there. But I am becoming um, a convert on the subject of extra things to do at the library because my kids are so excited about going. Um, we went to Lego Club this past month. Ooh, fun. And, yeah, it was awesome. They spent a good hour in the community room checking. um, Well, they had Lego kits for them to get and tons of Legos and other kids and they got to build things that they're now going to display in the library. And, you know, you ask yourself, well, what does this have to do with books? Well, I tell you, it was five o'clock when we finished. I was ready to go home and get something to eat. They would not let me leave until we had gone over to the children's section and checked our books out for the day. Oh, that's great. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you know, totally knew what we were there for. They had a great time doing the Legos, but we were not leaving that library without them getting their books. Well, and a lot of summer, or, yeah, a lot of libraries have summer reading programs where they have puppet shows or magic shows and um, concerts and free activities that are really pretty great. Yeah, there are, um, your library will probably have a calendar that you could even pick up now that has all of the things listed that they're going to have this summer. And just going to those different activities fosters a sense of fun with the kids. And they really, you know, start to feel like the library is a place where they can go for information, um, for fun activities, and they have a good feeling about going there. Yeah. And they look forward to it and makes it a happy place. So when they think back on going to the library, it's not um, it's not something they think of as a chore, which I don't really think any child would probably think that really. But, you know, they look forward to it. Something. Yeah, yeah. they do. Yeah. Exactly. Um, the last thing that I have is um, getting to know your library staff. Oh, yeah. Um, my daughter likes to call our librarian Miss Librarian. <laughs> <laughs> thrills her to death when um, she's walking up going, Miss Librarian, Miss Librarian, can you help me find the fairy books? Um, but it's a good thing. You know, she may not know her name, but um, she does know that she can ask her for help. She can ask her for book recommendations. And we start fostering this really young with the kids. Once they, you know, reach the age where they're no longer clutching to my legs when I ask them to speak to a stranger, um, if they have a question or want to know where something is, I encourage them to go up and ask the library staff um, for help. Yeah, we do that too. And even if I know the answer, I will try and have my kids go up and ask. Um, It's my impulse to answer them because I worked um, in a library for several years. Loved that job. That was such a fantastic job. (laughs) And um, so, you know, I have like Dewey decibel numbers in my head and (laughs) um, I could direct them where they need to go. But I try to have them go ask because I want them to form those relationships with the library staff. So yeah, I'm totally on board with that. And it's so important. And then your relationship with the library staff is also important just by having conversations with them about the different kinds of books that you 
enjoy in your family and the kinds of readings that you like to do aloud when you read aloud to your kids or the different things that you appreciate or the the topics that you're studying. If you're a homeschooling family, the topics that you're studying in your homeschool are what your kids might be interested in. And I really do think these librarians remember this information. So later on when they're your kid walks up to them and says, I, you know, I need a book about such and such. They kind of have an idea of where to steer them. Yeah. We've had that experience where we will go into the library and a librarian will say, oh, I saw a book that would be something that just reminded me of you or that would your family would really enjoy. And I love that. And I really think that um, really good librarian relationships, relationships with the people who work in our libraries are fantastic just a fantastic resource. That's something to cultivate for sure. It does take cultivation. You know, they're not going to be able to do that if they don't know you. And so um, taking the time to do that cultivation is a really, is a really big thing. It's going to make the library experience so much better for your family. Okay. So make it a priority. Uh, Go on a regular basis, get library cards for your kids, attend events and cultivate relationships with the library staff. Did I hit them all? That's it. Awesome. Well, before we go, I want to chat just for a moment about your new summer reading program, which is crazy awesome and pretty much different than every other summer reading program I've ever seen. So do you want to tell us about that real quick? Sure, I'd love to. Um, We have a summer reading program called Traveling Through the Pages, and it is available on my blog. If you go to edsnapshots.com, there is in the top menu bar, there is a link to the summer reading program. And also on the sidebar, there's a big yellow box that you can click on to get to the summer reading program as well. And basically what we have done is we have created this group of downloadable printables for you. And so when you enter in your email address, you get um, a link sent to your email and you can download the, the forms and the different things. And what we've got in there for you, we have a reading passport, which has a, kind of like a bingo grid on the inside. And what it does is it really encourages kids to break out of a reading rut and read different genres and stretch out into reading different things for the summer. Okay, yeah, because my kids do tend to read the exact same things. I mean, not the exact same books, but this, just the same genre. So my oldest is really into historical fiction. So to get her to read something else can be, it's just not what she tends to do on her own. I actually have to work at that. Yeah, I've got one who's into fairy books. Oh, and yeah, so- I've got one of those too. <laughs> As they start working through the bingo grid, you know, if they start up in one corner and they're going to work across or they're going to work down, they're going to come across, you know, if they're wanting to mark off a square, they're going to come across squares that challenge them to break out of those ruts and get into different genres. Some of the squares also have activities for them to do. It might ask them to look at a book of science experiments and choose an experiment to do or um, look at a cookbook and choose a recipe to make. Very fun. Kind of um, summer boredom busters there. And then we also have our Read Aloud Revival squares. Woo-hoo. which <laughs> Encourage you, mom or dad, to actually read maybe a favorite book from your childhood to your children or maybe a book that's laugh out loud funny. So we have the Reading Passport. We also have reading reward tickets. So once they have completed a column or a row, you can reward them. We give you some ideas, but, you know, things like a trip to the donut shop or um, going um, a movie ticket or going to the bookstore to buy a book. Oh, fun. Yeah, I like that one. Breakfast out with dad. You know, any kind of reward for... um, for finishing a row or a column. We also have bookmarks that you can print and laminate, um, a certificate for completing the program, and then reading logs to help keep track of the books and the pages that you've read, just in case you're also participating in some other summer reading programs this summer. And this is all free. Awesome. Okay, so listeners, if you missed it, you go to ed snapshots.com to get your traveling through the pages loot and I've seen it I've downloaded it I'm going to use it with my kids this summer and I'm pretty stoked about that so I'll have a link in the show notes too so you can find it very easily right 
thank you so much for coming on to the show. That was fun to chat with you here. (laughs) Now it's time for Let the Kids Speak. This is one of my favorite parts of the podcast, the time where kids can tell us in their own words about the books that have been read aloud to them. Hi there, my name is Madeline, and I live in northern Idaho, and I am 13 years old. One of my favorite read-alouds is called The Pendewicks. It's about four girls, their father, and a boy they meet on vacation. Their sweet, patient Rosalind, sarcastic and impatient Sky, daydreamer and writer Jane, and shy Batty, and oh, their lovable hound. My favorite adventure is when sarcastic and impatient Sky turns the oven on broiler when she is making cookies and almost burns the house down. Why did she make cookies, and why did she almost burn the house down? My answer is to read the book. My name is Caroline. I live in Idaho, and I am eight years old. My favorite read aloud is Little Pear. It's it's about a little boy in China who gets in a lot of mischief. My sister Erica read this book aloud to my five-year-old sister and to me. I would love to feature your child on the show. So if your child would like to tell us all about his or her favorite read aloud, then head to readaloudrevival.com, scroll to the bottom of the page, and click the orange button to leave me a message. That's it for today. I told you it was a great show. (laughs) For show notes, including links to everything we discussed in today's episode, including Tish's fabulous blog, theartofsimple.net, links to all the books we talked about, and a direct link to the Traveling Through the Pages summer reading program, head to readaloudrevival.com and look for episode three. The kind folks at sparklestories.com have generously offered one listener a travel package just in time for your summer wanderings. Sparkle Stories inspire a sense of wonder and magic, and this collection of travel tales will be a delight for your family car rides. For your chance to win, head to readaloudrevival.com. Next episode, I'll be chatting with Jim Weiss from Great Hall Productions about how we can get better and improve our skill when we're reading aloud to our kids. So make sure you're subscribed to the podcast so you don't miss it. Until next time, go build your family culture around books. (music) 